Right. So hello, everybody. Welcome. We are going to get started. Hello, I'm Amy Forbes, the training manager with the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. And I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Age Friendly Healthcare Meditations 3Ds, Dementia, Delirium and Depression with Emily Trichu. Please know this webinar is being recorded. A certificate Certification of attendance will be emailed to those who registered and attended, and we are not able to offer CEUs for this webinar. Now I'm going to talk briefly about our network and some important information before we get started today. The MHTTC is a nationwide network and we're supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. Our network includes 10 regional centers and a network coordinating office out of Stanford University. And you can see in the pink circle at the top of your screen, our Northwest MHTTC covers HHS Region 10, which includes Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington State. Our goals at the Northwest MHTTC are to support mental health related evidence based practices heighten awareness, knowledge, and skills of the behavioral health workforce, foster alliances and address diversity of training needs, and to share free publicly available training and technical assistance. Our areas of focus include evidence-based practices for psychosis, which includes CBTP and Assertive Community Treatment or ACT. We also uh, provide training on a wide variety of other topics. So please do check out our website um, this is where you'll be able to register for free webinars and or learning communities, watch recorded webinars, take a free online self-paced course with healthy knowledge. You can sign up for our weekly newsletter, review our resource library, or listen to our podcast called Putting It Together. For today's webinar, we will be sending a link to the recording, the slides, as well as your certificate of attendance within a couple weeks after this event. For communication during this event, please use the chat box to reach our staff if you need some help, or you would like to share your respectful comments, greetings, and observations with everyone in attendance. We do ask that you please use the Q&A box to type in your questions for our presenter. You can do this at any point throughout the presentation. We will be monitoring the Q&A box to facilitate answering as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. And also at the end of today's event, we will send out a link to our survey. Please know that your feedback is very important to the work that we do and the content that we provide. We are required by SAMHSA to conduct the survey, yet they do not have an official position on the content that we provide. And really quick, just sharing a couple upcoming webinars that we have. Uh, tomorrow, July 16th, we will be hosting the fourth and final session in our sexual health series in coordination with the AETC Mountain West. And then on July 25th, we'll be hosting a webinar educating on eating disorders and interventions. So please do check those out, register again on our website for those events. And I'm very happy to welcome and introduce you all to today's presenter. Emily Trichu is a clinical neuropsychologist and the Associate Director of Education and Evaluation with the Veterans Administration Puget Sound Healthcare Systems Geriatric Research Education Clinical Center. He is also a professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington School of Medicine. She has specialized in um, neurogenerative diseases and geriatrics throughout her career. We are so excited to have her here with us today. I'm gonna to stop sharing my screen and pass it on to you, Emily. The multi steps of trying to screen share and get everything up. So hopefully um, someone can give me a thumbs up or something that the slides are showing. 
Yes, you're good. Appreciate and appreciate it. Well, thanks everyone. Oh, and see, I'm getting the virtual ones too. That makes me feel good because now I know there's really people out there listening. Um, thank you so much for coming this afternoon and thank you so much to um, Amy and the other organizers uh, and Peyton for his uh, support today. Um, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to talk about um, age-friendly healthcare and in particular mentation, the three Ds, delirium, depression, and dementia. Now the next hurdle is to make sure my slides will forward. Here we go. Uh -oh, there we go, aha. So in terms of disclosures and acknowledgements, uh, I wish I had some financial disclosures, but I do not. Um, I do have uh, a number of views and opinions. Uh, I will be presenting them. I am trying to stick to my scientific and professional views and opinions, but you should know that they're not meant to reflect the uh, policy of either the US Department of Veterans Affairs or the University of Washington, uh, both of whom I work for and am affiliated with. I do have a collaborator that I worked on some of the module components here, um, some of the components here for a module that we put together for a particular allied health training curriculum. Uh, also, I wish to um, make the land acknowledgement that I both live and work on the traditional land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples. Um, and that uh, gives me a great deal of privilege to be able to be here, so thank you. All right, so thinking about the Northwest region, I work for the VA, so instead of talking about Region 10, like this group is, um, I also have my regional thing, and I'm in what's considered the Region 20, so it's the Veterans Integrated Service Network. Um, but the point of that is there's a lot of overlap here between these regions, uh, so I think our areas of particular interests are in sync. What is critical to this talk is that our population is aging um, and it's happening in all of the states. Some are being hit more so than others. Uh, also near and dear to my heart is trying to address inequity for folks that live more rurally um, or have barriers to transportation. And so not only is there this aging percentage of the population that's important to me, but there's also the access to uh, specialty care, to geriatrics care and the like that can be different and not always in sync with the percent of aging population. So when we think about where to put our resources or where we need to build resources, it can be even more complicated than just simple numbers. Not that numbers are simple, but. Uh, so I'm often challenged, and, and you all might be as well, thinking about how do we provide the best mental health and regular and general health care for this increasing and changing demographic. I will tell you right now that in terms of geriatric specialists, it just can't happen there. There just aren't enough. Um, we're even unfortunately witnessing a bit of a slowdown in folks that are um, going into geriatrics as a specialty. So we won't meet the need there. Will it happen through primary care providers? Um, I'll tell you what, they're gonna carry a lot of the load, but with the numbers of veterans, uh, sorry, veterans of people that need to be seen um, and time limits for encounters, that's not gonna meet the need either. So at the end of the day, I um, emphasize that primary care team, which here at the VA, the system in which I provide my clinical care is called a patient aligned care team. But I think you know what's meant by that. It means every person who's part of the team has an important role in meeting these needs. Um, from the administrative person who does scheduling and phone calls, reminder phone calls especially, to um, just all the staff um, as a psychologist, um, social work, nursing, as well as um, sometimes the primary care provider. So I think um, that you will hopefully agree with me that this team approach is best um, when we think about the important needs. Um, and as I stress about what the declines in mentation uh, can look like and what they can mean uh, and for uh, older folks. So thinking about mentation, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with age-friendly healthcare systems. If you are not, I really recommend uh, going online and doing a little bit of reading. It is an initiative that started off with the uh, Hartford Foundation and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in collaboration with many others. Um, but it's a framework with which um, we as healthcare providers can approach aging in a, a positive and affirmative manner. Instead of always being disease focused or prescriptive, we want to talk to the people with whom we're working about these different topics in particular, the four M's. And of course, starting at the top is one of the most critical ones, what matters. 
Um, it's really silly to tell someone a whole bunch of things that they should do to improve their health if it doesn't align at all with what matters to them, what's important in their lives, and what gives them quality of life. Uh, other aspects are mobility, medications, and then you won't be surprised today, we're really going to talk about mentation. I'm going to focus on that. These things are interconnected. You can't really have one without the other. Um, I definitely am biased, though. I think mentation is the foundation of this triangle, even if they weren't thinking about it when they built this graphic, um, because being able to talk to older adults about what matters is reliant somewhat upon their mentation. And so we want to support mentation um, as much as possible across the spectrum of mentation challenges um, and try whenever we can to get at these other important things, especially what matters. So specifically talking about mentation and aging, uh, I'll be describing mentation uh, in case that's not a word you use very often. Uh, I'll be talking about dementia, one of the three Ds, especially what it is, what it's not. Also, uh, we'll talk a bit about depression and aging and how that relates to other aspects of mental health. And then also um, think about delirium, that's the third D, and it, critically being able to identify it and then proactively work to prevent delirium. So this sort of mentation term, what is this? Well, it really comprises mental health and cognitive function. I often find myself perplexed with how this seems to get split. Um, you go to one hospital system and all of cognition, sort of thinking about dementia, delirium, and those three, uh, those two comes under like neurology. So somehow that's a medical health thing. And yet um, depression, and then in some systems also dementia, comes under mental health umbrellas. And it really seems like it should just be one big umbrella, in my opinion, because these, um, this is just too complex to sort of put in silos. Uh, so the mentation includes those three Ds that I've mentioned. We also need to think about, you know, what are the normative or sort of, I prefer the term typical changes in aging that you might see with thinking abilities. Also, we all want to be on the lookout, no matter what our role is in the healthcare team, for the red flags uh, that can signal changes in mood or thinking that would be important, of course, to catch as early as possible in, in an ideal healthcare system to be taking preventive steps. Um, we also really need to think about how different aspects of mentation are so critical for supporting independence in daily function. So thinking about what might be considered typical cognitive aging, there are certain types of thinking abilities that are just not expected to show changes with increasing age. One's ability to have one's own autobiographical memory to know, say, for instance, that I took a vacation in May and who I went with and what countries I went to, um, as well as long term autobiographical information. Uh, you know, where did I grow up? Um, for the veterans that I serve in my healthcare delivery, you know, what, what branch of the service were they in? What years did they serve? Things like that. Um, other types of uh, re you know, well-learned information and that retrieval of it. Um, things we learned in school. What's the capital of France? You know, probably even if you've never been there, you could still remember that it's Paris. Another thing that's expected to stay steady with aging is procedural memory. This is the stuff that we learned when we were younger. Um, how to brush our teeth, how to tie our shoes, uh, uh, how to drive a car even. Um, and also emotional processing. This is important, especially for thinking about mood and, and well being. Uh, the stereotypical sort of things that we see in the media or um, on TV and in movies is these changes that someone becomes grumpy as they get older or they mellow out. Um, but the, the idea that this would be changing dramatically gets really blown out of proportion for what's typical. Uh, that should stay pretty steady throughout one's life. There may be subtle changes, to be fair. Uh, what does seem to have some declines, some changes with aging, are the ability um, to encode larger groups of information quickly. Uh, so older adults may be a little slower to learn new tasks. That doesn't mean they can't learn new tasks or, or you know, won't get there. Um, they just might need a little bit more repetition. Also, that ability to juggle 50 things at once that that 22 year olds seem to be able to do just doesn't last as long. Um, 
So that multitasking and heavy working memory load also does show typically some declines with age. Also processing speed um, does seem to inevitably show some declines with age. So a little bit more here on that typical cognitive aging. I always like a graphic to help kind of get it in my head. I'm hoping that my uh, cursor here will show up for you all sharing my screen. If not, I'm going to try to talk through it anyway because it's not good contrast. Uh, this is a study done locally, actually, the Seattle, um, oh my gosh, uh, Seattle SLS, Seattle Longitudinal Study um, of Aging and Cognition. And they use some older tests that are not typically the neuropsychological tests I would use now, use now for assessing for dementia, um, but they kind of get at the same things. And here are the categories that they get at. You can see that speed of processing, working memory, uh, not only are declining over the decades, they actually start their very slow decline um, when one's in their 20s. So we just don't tend to notice that these are changing because we have other abilities. See the warm colors here. They're actually getting better across the decades of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. There's sort of an inflection point between the two that happens between the 50s and 60s. I do think that is when some people who are particularly aware of subtle changes in their thinking might show up for memory concerns because they're just very aware of this, this shift in kind of whether they're increasing in their abilities or now holding steady or uh, having basically becoming aware of some evidence of decline. So a quick knowledge check. This is kind of hard to do with such a large group. Um, so the idea is, and you can use um, the chat for a what it's called a waterfall where you start throwing in your answers. I won't be able to see it as well as you'll be able to see each other's, but it might give you a sense of sort of what your knowledge check is doing in relation to others. So I want you to think of either put an A or a B if you think the following are likely age related, sort of typical aging, or are red flags. And of course, I haven't taught you what the red flags are. So this is not a fair quiz, but it's more just a self check. So how about not being able to recall major parts of one's own life? Go ahead and start putting some thoughts in the chat there. Oh my, and I may have just started too big of a waterfall, right? I have to remember how many people are on here. But so that's probably great. So yes, um, that is a clear red flag. That is worrisome. How about learning new tasks more slowly? For instance, you get a new smartphone. Is that likely age related or a red flag? Oh, look at y'all, you're rocking it, yes. That is more likely age related. Um, and in fact, when people do that shift from just a, a regular phone, a flip phone or something to their first smartphone, there may be even a little bit more of a learning curve. How about not being able to remember well-learned facts like a US president? Uh, now we're not all gonna remember all of them, but if you can't remember that George Washington was the first president, that could be a red flag. Yes, not, a, not an A, a B, a B red flag. Good job. How about this one? Having trouble with multitasking, maybe carrying on a conversation while also balancing your checkbook. Is that likely age related or a red flag? Yeah, it's likely age related. In fact, by age related, I mean any age. I don't know if I was ever able to do that, um, but I'm quite sure since I hit, got into my 40s and beyond you know, that, I, that I definitely need to have someone stop talking to me while I'm trying to do math. Um, how about describing steps in a common task, like how to mail a letter? Is that likely age-related or B, a, a red flag? It's a red flag. Yeah, I should probably move a little faster. How about um, responding a bit slower to new information, needing time to process details? That's likely age-related, um, unless it's starting to interfere with being able to keep up with other things going on. And then in terms of um, thinking about mood and emotion, Losing track of emotional tones and detaching quickly. Is that a red flag? It is. Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody, for jumping in with the chat thing. Okay. So why do we care if they're typical changes or not? Well, we do because not all changes are typical. While everyone experiences some slight cognitive changes during aging, more a little, some a little bit more than others. What we're wanting to look out for are the changes that could indicate a transition state of mild cognitive impairment that is perhaps itself a red flag or risk factor for developing dementia. If you ask um, even middle-aged people, but especially um, more older age people, what is something that they most fear? Uh, 
getting dementia and losing that autonomy that cognition provides is at the top of the list. So we always want to be thinking about that. However, not all changes in mentation are dementia, and we have no cures or really effective treatments for dementia at this point. But so we always want to be on the lookout for could it be something else and therefore treatable. So mental health things that are treatable, um, they're not easy to treat, but they are treatable include depression, which I'll talk more about later, but also anxiety. Uh, and, and uh, also post-traumatic stress disorder, which has higher prevalence numbers amongst the veterans that I serve in my clinical care. Also substance use disorders. And I think there's sometimes um, a misperception that substance use disorders don't come on for the first time in later life. And that is not true. Um, you have to be on the uh, lookout for that across all aspects, all uh, across the continuum of aging. So in terms of impacts on uh, functional independence, cognition is essential for all these bullet points here. And these send us sort of like, oh yeah, of course they do. But mental health is also essential for many aspects of functional independence, whether it's attending to one's own self-care, making good choices, having positive relationships, as well as being able to anticipate future needs and avoiding conflict um, and possibly legal challenges in one's life. So for me, what I hear in clinic and you might hear in your clinical um, situations might be things like this. I can't focus. She's not interested in her usual activities. Uh, I'm not going to read these all. Uh, my favorite is my husband's selective, uh, selective attention is worse. He doesn't listen to me at all anymore. Um, I personally uh, just last week couldn't figure out, remember where I put my car in the parking lot. Um, but even more critical things, like you didn't tell me to increase one medication and stop another, and we can see how that could have safety issues. So at the end of the day, do any of these seem to you to be specific to delirium, dementia, um, or depression? At the end of the day, they're not necessarily. It could be any of the three. Regardless, though, they are red flags, and that's what we're going to keep looking out for is red flags, and then how do we act on them? So in terms of dementia, I like to give this as, as a general diagnosis. It's a clinical syndrome, dementia is. It is not the specific underlying disease. It's a clinical syndrome. So for instance, if we say someone has a cold, it's because they have certain symptoms that meet um, what we think of as a cold, and we've ruled out other types of things like certain viral infections or whatnot. Dementia is kind of the same way. Uh, only in this case, it's a decline in some aspect of thinking ability and or behavior. And it has to hit all of these four points. It needs to be significant. It has to have functional consequences to meet the criteria for dementia. As a result of the, thing, the changes in thinking or behavior, there needs to be a loss of independence in function. Uh, it needs to be chronic. Dementia doesn't get better. It usually has a fairly insidious onset. It gets worse over time, although there are different patterns of progression, different rates of progression, and maybe even somebody has a good day, maybe a couple good days. But if you look over any sort of span of time, they are not getting better and they are getting progressively worse. Uh, and it needs to be a loss, so it's got to be a new impairment. It can't be something lifelong. Um, or in the case of someone, say, say, who had a head injury when they were younger, they might have a new baseline from that. So this needs to be a decline from whatever their uh, most recent baseline would be. Uh, also, it's at the, it's, you know, the presumption is, and, and the reason we make this as a clinical diagnosis, is that we are um, seeing these changes because there is something going on in the brain. There is structural damage that's occurring and neurons are dying. So dementia is not, and this is a little cheeky of me, it's not delirium, it's not depression, um, but really importantly, it's not due to sensory deficits or communication problems. So say if someone had a stroke um, and they became aphasic, uh, you would want to be really careful if you're assessing for a decline in thinking to not deem them, basically um, misattribute the problems they're having on your testing due to having uh, an aphasia or similarly vision or hearing problems. Uh, and it's definitely not normal aging. So what are the uh, number of types of dementia, meaning things that can, uh, you know, different flavors of dementia? Here's a bunch of them. Uh, I usually at this point, I can't remember how many people, we've got 153 participants. So I won't have you um, take yourself off, take yourselves off mute and tell me, but 
I'm guessing in your mind, imagine which one of these do you think is most prevalent in aging? If you said Alzheimer's type dementia, you are correct. Uh, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia are both very prevalent as well. I chose to highlight here Parkinson's disease with dementia because there's um, often a misunderstanding that if you have Parkinson's disease, it's purely a motor disorder. Uh, for folks that are older, especially if they've had Parkinson's disease for 10 years or more, they are at very high risk for developing a Parkinson's disease dementia. There's also frontotemporal dementia, which has a number of personality and behavioral changes associated with it. I include that, even though it's a much smaller percentage of those with dementia, it does present dramatically. It has a whole host of other challenges. And when you work in mental health settings, you might be more likely to encounter these folks, especially before they've been accurately diagnosed. So thinking about prevalent causes of dementia in older adults, I mentioned this dementia term is just a, a clinical descriptor of what's going on caused by some type of neurodegenerative disease process. In vascular dementia, that disease process is cerebrovascular changes um, of all different types. Uh, in Alzheimer's type dementia, it's being caused by Alzheimer's disease. Lewy body dementia, the third most common, is being caused by Lewy body disease that's happening in the brain. There are many things, though, that can mimic dementia, and we have to really be looking out for these. Um, for instance, there could be toxic metabolic changes that could be uh, giving a clinical uh, presentation that is similar to early dementia. Uh, there's systemic illnesses. Um, and even I think this other category is the one that I always look out for the most, and that is whether there is a significant depression or there's a flare and post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, even stress can really cause uh, uh, what looks like a mild cognitive impairment that can seem to be impacting daily living. Also, um, alcohol, uh, different drug use, sleep apnea, undiagnosed slash untreated, especially when moderate to severe, is probably my number one thing that looks like early um, stages of Alzheimer's disease. Now, we want to identify these. But it's important to remember that treatment may improve them, but they may not always fully reverse the symptoms. And that's the, the challenge with that is, is that it can be an underlying uh, neurodegenerative process that is causing folks to have more problems in their health care and mental health care and taking care of themselves. So we never want to stop paying attention uh, for those cognitive changes that were what led us to diagnose these things in the first place. Uh, switching gears to delirium, there's lots of different terms sometimes for delirium. Uh, nowadays, luckily, I think most folks are using delirium more regularly because uh, otherwise it gets confusing. Importantly, though, a delirium is a medical condition. It typically has a more rapid onset. There are deficits that the core deficits that are typically identi are identified are attention and concentration changes. There's also often a very notable waxing and waning of these mental status changes. Uh, folks may be, seem quite normal for a few hours, and then a few hours later, they are very confused. Um, the infections, medications, metabolic abnormal, or abnormalities are very common causes. Mental status changes in older adults often precede the objective signs of illness. So that unfortunately makes it harder to detect because people are not always as good about getting themselves to care. It's often family members, neighbors, other loved ones who are the ones who identify that there's this um, more acute onset of, of cognitive decline. Uh, let's see, it is high, it, um, Delirium is very under-recognized in the earliest stages, and that's one of the things that hopefully this talk will help prevent, um, and it is really important. Um, the first author on this Lancet article I've here, I've here from 2014, I can't believe it's 10 years old already, but it's a really great article, I recommend it, uh, and the lead author on that is Sharon Inui out of Boston. Uh, she's a delirium research guru, so I highly recommend reading up on her work if you have more interest in this. Delirium is not insignificant. Um, this is, is huge. It's a medical condition with an acute onset and it uh, has a lot of associations with increased mortality. You can follow people up to two years later and they're still at higher risk of dying. 
Definitely not dementia, which has a typically a slower onset, slower decline, and much more subtle fluctuations if there are fluctuations. Delirium is not rapidly resolving. So I mentioned that the mental status changes can precede objective signs of illness, but the problem is, is that someone say acutely delirious ends up in the hospital, it's discovered they have a urinary tract infection and you give them even, maybe even IV antibiotics, and then the tests are all showing that they're clear, their cognition may still be um, confused at least a little bit. And so what happens is they get discharged and they end up back in the hospital because the same cognitive challenges are gonna come back up again and they're gonna have trouble with self-care when they're at home, especially if alone. Delirium is not normal aging. So what are risk factors for delirium? Hospital, being hospitalized is a, a major risk factor for delirium. Uh, up to 40% of older adults. Uh, there are certain risk factors within that, um, having a diagnosis of dementia, depending how severe your illness was that got you in the hospital, visual impairment, um, being catheterized, not surprisingly, low albumin, and also not surprisingly, length of stay. Uh, there's also high rates of delirium in hip fracture samples. Uh, and in this particularly large study, there were 35% with delirium. They had a similar but slightly different set of um, risk factors that they found associated with that. So here is just sort of a checklist for thinking about recognizing delirium. I'm not going to read through the whole thing. It is important, though, to recognize that um, they can present differently, or it can present differently in different settings, and I put little notes there for that. Maybe I'll take one second to point out this hyperactive versus hypoactive state. Uh, that can be tricky. Hyperactive folks end up exhibiting strange behaviors and often get attention. It's not always positive uh, in the case of if they're, say, doing something illegal or out in public that they shouldn't be doing. Um, but they often end up in emergency rooms uh, and then get some sort of treatment. The hypoactive state where people actually become quite sedated um, is often scarier because it's it's recognized much, much later. So if you think of someone who's living in a nursing home, staff might even be relieved when the, the, the patient or the um, resident is quieter than they usually are, are not asking repetitive questions, uh, and therefore they might not get that attention until it's a bit further gone. Okay, switching to depression. Uh, you know, this is a, a pretty standard list of symptoms of, of both psychological and bodily for depression. Uh, some are more obvious than others, but others can be pretty subtle. I think in aging, a challenge is that problems with sleep are pretty typical as with increasing age because of changes in our sleep architecture. There can be changes in appetite that may have nothing to do with depression, but vice versa. It could be due to depression, but are getting written off as otherwise. So it's important to kind of ask about a lot of these things, not just to ask, are you feeling sad, to be able to get at whether there is a possible depression. So it's not uh, just a bad day, a week, or a month. It should try, it's hard to tease out sometimes with grief or a natural reaction to some sort of loss or a new medical illness, uh, but trying to tease that out is important. It's definitely not a cause of dementia. One of my least favorite or, or least liked terms is pseudo-dementia. That is both uh, hazardous, I think, to good dementia care, uh, care of someone with dementia, and it's also not a good approach, uh, a good approach to folks who are suffering from depression. Uh, depression is definitely not untreatable in older adults. So when we want to recognize depression, I've already kind of hinted at this, it's important to think about some of those um, uh, physical symptoms, such as fatigue, pain, gastrointestinal concerns, uh, those might be partially either um, may seem worse to the individual because they are experiencing a depression um, uh, or may be due to other things so that can make it really hard to tease out. Depending on the individual, you know, some older patients might be less likely than younger patients to uh, sort of admit to share that they're, they're feeling down. Uh, and across all age ranges, um, but especially sometimes for older adults, depression is stigmatized. I personally really like to ask about mood in more than one way and more than once. I like to have them fill out a little questionnaire 
I like to ask them about it once we work together, even for a, just a short amount of time, just enough time to have a little rapport. I like to ask questions about mood in front of loved ones and then when they are no longer in the room to see if that, um, if they're maybe trying to protect a loved one by not sharing. And I put protect in air quotes, like they, their, their senses is that it would burden their loved one um, if they shared that they were really down or blue. Uh, so using those words right there, I would say it's also important to ask about it in different ways. Uh, someone may say, no, I'm not depressed. But when you ask them if they're feeling down, they'll say, yes, they're feeling blue. Um, they're feeling agitated. They're frustrated. All these different types of symptoms. Uh, as many as 10% of folks who are over 65 seen in primary care have endorsed clinically significant uh, symptoms of depression. Uh, but unfortunately, research has shown that only about 10% of those folks are actually getting treatment. So we can do better in um, all settings, um, especially in primary care, not just identifying, but doing warm handoffs, having systems in place to be able to connect the patients with the care uh, and not make it burdensome when they need help at a time when they are less able to um, uh, advocate for themselves due to what they're suffering, what they're dealing with. Uh, behavioral activation is a really incredible um, and important tool for trying to improve mood. Uh, but that said, you know, younger and older adults also respond equally well to sort of our typical treatments, whether it's psychotherapy and or pharmacotherapy. Uh, this is where, though, uh, people's uh, physical health is important, though, considering what might be the best treatment options. Adding a bunch of pills for someone might not be so great. Um, on the other hand, in certain populations, maybe someone who has a moderate dementia or has had um, some cognitive decline, psychotherapy, certainly things like cognitive behavioral therapy might not be, or, or sort of more of these manualized treatments um, might not be as, uh, as useful. Okay, I am not in any way um, recommending any particular medications here. Um, this was just an article that really did a nice job of talking about late life depression um, and did sort of do first line therapies and such for a uh, pretty clear cut depression. Uh, the, the reason I really put this up here is not to tout any particular medication, but more to remind everyone that the beers list exists. The beers list is a guide to um, help healthcare providers so as to not prescribe medications that are unsafe in older adults. Given that metabolism, body composition, things change with aging, certain medications are definitely not recommended, especially those that have anticholinergic um, side effects. Uh, so, you know, it's great to recognize things, but that it's important if you're going to prescribe, if you're going to think about medications for any of the stuff I'm talking about today, uh, you would want to be consulting and have someone prescribing who's familiar with the beer's criteria. Okay, so a little bit more for depression. Um, thinking about older adults, it is important to watch people over time uh, as there are, you know, high rates of depression in certain settings. Post-hospitalization tends to be one. Also cognitive impairment, if it exists with the depression, can be predictive of less, uh, less good response to antidepressants. And then also depression in later life is um, a pretty strong red flag uh, at, for preclinical dementia. Doesn't mean you have preclinical dementia or that you have dementia, but it has been associated with higher risk for conversion or later you know, diagnosis of dementia. Also um, related to mood, but not always related to mood, are um, risks of suicide. Uh, it is in general higher rates in older adults. Also there are, depending on where you live in different populations, um, there might be higher rates there in certain demographic groups. I know working at the VA that there are higher rates in general in veterans, in the Veterans Health Administration. Um, uh, cisgender males, um, not any, there's no good research really um, for trans populations and non-binary populations. Uh, it's also often higher, not always higher though, in uh, either white and not uh, Native American peoples. Okay, so here I have a little table uh, adapted from one I got from Stephen Bielke, who's another professor in the Department of Psychiatry uh, back when we worked together here. Uh, and it kind of highlights some common features between the 3Ds, as well as some of the things, I won't call them true differential 
descriptions, but sort of hallmarks of things that are much more likely in the three separately. Uh, and the challenge is, is that, wow, you know, here you have this. It should be really easy to distinguish them from each other, right? Unfortunately, there's a lot of overlap in syndromes uh, across the board. I just have a few things I would just mention, you know, for instance, studies have seen that delirium superimposed on dementia can have rates as high as 58%. Um, and that's difficult um, because that makes that much, that much harder to treat in the moment, but also that much harder to prevent moving forward. Uh, there's a lot of overlap in hospitalized older adults, uh, whether it's delirium. And this particular study from 2009 looks specifically at delirium and depression. You can see those percentages there. Um, and the key thing with that is that in the overlap syndrome, they had higher odds of one month functional decline and nursing home placement or death at one year. So there's significant potential outcomes from these overlaps. I mentioned um, rates of depression and dementia can be quite high, uh, sometimes as high as 86%. There's a little chicken or the egg, you know, what's causing it or are they coincident? It's tricky. So I put together a case. It's not a real case, although I got to tell you, if you take pieces of this, this is a pretty common presentation for me. We're going to call this veteran Joseph. Uh, a, in this case, a 66-year-old uh, cisgender male veteran. Uh, he's been divorced for a couple of years from his second wife, and it was a pretty, not a sh super short marriage, but less than five years. Uh, he's new to the primary clinic, care clinic, and moved to be closer to his daughter. He's living independently in his apartment, but his daughter's come in with him for this initial visit with the primary care doc because he just sits around all day and he forgets what I tell him. In terms of premorbid history, medical history, he has diabetes and hypertension, and they've both historically been under quite good control. So do we already have some red flags? I think we do, right? Um, we already are hearing from his daughter that he sits around all day and forgets what I tell him. I'll tell you what, we still don't know. Uh, that doesn't, that's a red flag, but it does not tell us if it's depression, uh, delirium, or dementia. But we should be worried about any of the three or multiple. So interestingly, labs were drawn um, and uh, blood pressure was taken and current blood pressure and glucose were actually out of range. So there's question marks there. Uh, one might be wondering, is he taking his medications and insulin is prescribed? Worse would be that you assume he is and that he is having his um, health, health is declining and so someone might prescribe him more uh, medications. It's better to at least wonder, wait a second, is everything okay? Maybe he's not taking them. And if he's not taking them, it could be due to any of the three Ds, right? Uh, when, you, uh, when someone asks him more, uh, you learn uh, that he is missing his ex-wife, even though he really didn't like her and was really happy to get divorced. Um, and he's also saying that he doesn't have any friends where he is now. He also doesn't seem cognitively sharp. He seems a bit disengaged at the visit. All right, so the next steps, um, given that the red flags were identified, it would be to initiate a workup, right? It's important to think about what are some of the available tools for identification and for screening. And this is where I am going to tout our own uh, 3D's pocket card that we developed here at the VA. This is freely available. I don't make any money from this. Um, and frankly, the components I'm going to talk about can be used by anyone. Um, you don't need the pocket card. We just put it together in a pocket card so that it would be um, easier for to distribute um, and get out to help people. The newest uh, uh, edition of it, it's been around since, geez, 2011, is a 2021 version, but it's still no major changes have occurred. So um, there's a little delirium panel in the pocket card. Um, we actually went ahead because of how um, important a topic delirium is, especially when it comes to identification. Uh, and prevention, we created a delirium reference card as well. It focuses on really more of an outpatient identification, prevention, and, and different types of approaches for delirium. So that's available as well. Both of them have the CAM in it, the confusion assessment method. The delirium pocket card has um, the brief confusion assessment method. I have this in your slides here so that you have this nice little flow sheet um, that can be used if you print this up or whatever, just to give credit to um, some colleagues at Vanderbilt that, that adapted this from the main confusion assessment method. Um, but of course, you can see here on feature one is, is there altered mental status or fluctuating course? 
Um, if there is, is there inattention? Are folks having trouble with attention? Are they having altered levels of consciousness? Uh, there's the RAS that can help with that. I've got that on the next slide. And then of course, um, you can jump right from there to being BCAM positive to delirium is present. Um, and then of course, disorganized thinking, when you work in more of a mental health setting, you might come uh, and be wondering what's going on with that as well, because uh, there could be something else going on. Uh, the RAS that I mentioned, the Richmond uh, Agitation and Sedation Scale is right here, you'll have that. This is a modified version um, for use in the ICU. I'm sorry, the original RAS is for um, ICU settings, and then this modified version is for non-ICU settings, although I do think it still tends to be more um, for residential or nursing home or other, um, other units of the hospital. So in terms of working up delirium, trying to have collateral sources of information. So thinking about Joseph, you know, talking to his daughter, does he seem more confused as he's acutely coming on? Because Joseph, it, if he is delirious, is really not going to have um, the cognitive skills and the mental status to talk about recent timelines or things like that. And then as healthcare providers, we want to think about the, the broad differential. This is the acronym that the med students were being taught when I was in graduate school. Uh, and it's a little negative, but I appreciate that it's trying to make it clear that there is significant mortality and morbidity associated with delirium, uh, especially if it goes unchecked. So you can see what the IWATCH DEF um, acronym stands for here, and that helps for the work on this area. So in Joseph's case, he was not um, found to be positive for delirium. His timeline was very different, things like that. So shifting gears to our other D, another one of our Ds, sorry, depression. Uh, the things I want to emphasize about this is that you don't have to be a mental health professional to ask about symptoms of depression. Uh, if you use recommended tools to guide you, and really importantly, you have a plan for how to triage folks if you get a positive, um, these are all really important facets of healthcare. Uh, screening is even covered by Medicare Part B if you're you know, thinking about working with older adults. Uh, I recommend uh, a number of different tools, the PHQ-2 and PHQ-9 I'll talk about in a second. They're pretty short um, and they're um, free and common. The geriatric depression scale, the 30 item and 15 item versions are quite good. I use the, as a neuropsychologist in geriatric settings, I use the 30, the full 30 item version. Uh, and then here at the Veterans Health Administration, we add in for everyone, regardless of positive or negative screen for depression, we ask about um, suicide. And I'll mention that in just a second. So for the PHQ-2, it's just a quick self-report screen. Um, it may be appropriate for your setting. Over the past two weeks, you ask people how often have you been bothered by these problems, and then they kind of rate it on a scale from zero, not at all, up to three, where it's happening, they're experiencing it nearly every day. And these two heavy hitters are the, um, the first one is basically anhedonia, having no interest or pleasure in doing things, and then two, essentially endorsing depression, feeling down or hopeless. So if you have a score of three or greater, you're supposed to do the PHQ-9. Personally, I think that it's just nice to start with the PHQ-9. You'll see it here. It uses the same scale as the PHQ-2. Um, the first two questions are the PHQ-2 questions, but it gets at a lot more areas here. Um, and importantly, number nine does ask, are you at all having, um, over the past two weeks, times of thinking that you would be better off dead or that you want to hurt yourself in some way? So this can be a really critical tool for providing good care. Joseph's workup was positive. Uh, he did not endorse suicidality. So he did not endorse um, nine. Uh, and uh, that's good. There was a bit of a follow-up though, regardless, um, even though he didn't say that. And the, I mentioned it, the suicide, the Columbia, oh, now of course I'm blanking on the SSRS uh, acronym. But basically the suicide screener ask not just about whether you've been experiencing any of these in the past month, but also if you've experienced them in your lifetime. Uh, having experienced these previously, even if it was a long time ago, has been shown to typically can be associated with higher risk for suicidality in the current day. Uh, Joseph denied both current or past suicidal ideation. Okay, dementia. Here are red flags. So we've talked a lot about a bunch of different red flags.
flags, right? But here's a list um, of published red flags. These are signs and symptoms that a clinician, a caregiver, or a patient themselves may report. And any of them should prompt any the, the team basically to engage to evaluate cognition. I will not read over all of these, but just things like um, failing to keep appointments when someone used to be really good at keeping appointments, that's a red flag. Unexplained weight loss is a red flag. Um, and of course, not being able to follow directions, getting lost, things like that, all red flags. So we remember there's like a couple different components for potentially having a dementia diagnosis. And one of them is that there are changes, objective changes in thinking abilities and or um, behavior. In this case, we're focusing about thinking, and one of the quickest and dirtiest tools um, is the mini-cog. Uh, I'll emphasize quickest. I just think it's a little dirty because I've had people pass this and actually have some um, objective, uh, significantly below expectation cognition. Um, but it can be really useful when the, somebody, say, mentions something like as they're walking out your door, right? You've spent an hour with them. You've talked about all these other things going on. And then as they walk out, they bring up, oh yeah, and by the way, I got lost in my neighborhood last week and I couldn't find my way home. And, you know, a neighbor had to, to walk me back. Um, this could be a really good tool for that situation. So you get their attention and you give them three words that you let them know you want them to repeat and remember. Uh, and you don't score that portion. Uh, you then give them a piece of paper and ask them to draw a clock. And the specific instructions are here. Um, and it's bit by bit. You don't have to say all the instructions at once. And then you ask them what were the three words that you asked them to remember. So the total score is only five. And the scoring suggestions are that three to five points means no impairment. Um, but zero to two means possible impairment. I'll tell you what. If somebody gets all three words, but they have a bad clock, I will not say that that's a pass. So that's where I say it's a little dirty. As a neuropsychologist, there are different types of dementia causes that can cause significant visual spatial deficits. And you would miss that person if you just went by sort of the suggested scoring um, cutoffs. So consider that, but it's still useful, especially when you need something fast. Uh, let's see, I'm not going to go read over this, but there's just some extra things to remember about the mini cog. Um, there's rules about the clock. There are lots of other brief cognitive tests out there. I tend to recommend either um, the slums here at the VA because it was developed at the VA, even though it's called the St. Louis University Mental Status Examination. It was actually VA folks with a St. Louis University affiliation who developed it and all of the initial data was collected on older white male veterans. Um, so that's a good free test that's out there that's 30 points, so a bit more sensitivity. Um, and then the MOCA is kind of my favorite. It has stolen some of the more sensitive pieces um, across the domains of a neuropsychological evaluation and put them in this 30 point uh, test. Now, if there's a trouble, a lot of trouble in a particular area, it's sometimes hard to know what it's really due to. Um, and it's certainly not a diagnostic measure, but it can be quite useful. People often um, sometimes like the blessed. Uh, I don't mind it. I'll just mention though, it's reverse scored. So I've seen people get confused in chart notes when they're looking at it. Um, a high score is actually worse uh, and a low score is better. So I've seen some confusion there with that. There's a few other uh, tests out there that have US versions, even though they were developed in Australia. Okay, uh, a little bit more on the, the, the MOCA. It is more sensitive than the traditional mini mental status examination. It is really well researched. I also like that there's a lot of different um, versions in English as well as other languages. Um, although you do need someone who's qualified to administer it in other languages. Um, I, I personally could pick up, say, uh, a German version and administer it properly. Uh, I do like that the MOCA has a validated um, blind slash telephone version. They're one and the same, as well as a telemedicine version. They have set up though that you need some training and certification to do it. Um, most public entities though now have a ways of doing that and having it covered by your institution. Okay, so the St. Louis mental status examination is uh, perfectly acceptable for many populations. You of course have to use standard instructions. 
I would argue it's kind of a good news, bad news situation though, because it's free um, and no training is required. Um, although I call that a sort of yay, because it means that people might not really know what they're doing. Not that it's hard to give these tests, um, but it's important to practice a little bit and be familiar with the test um, and know how to do it properly. I think the biggest challenge for me is that they had that really small, limited research sample. Um, and not surprisingly, because we VA clinicians don't really get support for these things. There wasn't a lot of follow-up research, not the way the MOCA was. Um, there's also some bias, um, both cultural and for those with lower socioeconomic status. Uh, the story that's in the slums is about um, a woman who's a stockbroker. Um, I'm going to tell you that not everyone is familiar with what a stockbroker is. Um, that's kind of uh, pretty biased right there. The telephone version, there's no official telephone version, but there's actually most of the items on this test are pretty verbal. So you actually can do a telephone version with a total score of 26, just prorating it. So that's nice. Um, and then for telemedicine, it's really easily adaptable. Um, of course, that's not standard administration. You would want to document that you're not doing it standardized. Um, but in terms of utility, that's not bad. The uh, MOCA's blind version, tele telephone version, I think you end up with only 22 points. Um, and that is obviously really reduces uh, your sense of your uh, discrimination ability. So what's the utility of these brief cognitive tests? Um, I have sort of three key bullet points here uh, to obtain a quick sense of global cognitive function, maybe to catch some things early. Um, also, I think in extreme situations, uh, medical situations, it could be catching that somebody might not have medical decision-making capacity and that possibly things are moving forward and they don't really understand what they're signing consent for. No matter what, I want to emphasize that the answer to what is the utility of brief cognitive tests is not to be a single thing on which to diagnose a cognitive disorder like dementia. Uh, that's really important. I like it sometimes um, as a, it's just a way sometimes to motivate people towards a positive behavioral change. Say they get a score of 28 out of 30, it's not really a red flag. Um, but if they're concerned about their thinking, they might be reassured that they likely don't have dementia but positively motivated towards other changes in their life, maybe quitting smoking, maybe picking up some exercise or more activity. Uh, with these cognitive screens, you've got to think about interpretation and appropriate populations, sort of thinking about the bell curve, people who are far at the tails outside the average range, it's going to have poor detection ability, maybe for those who have a learning disability or fewer years of formal education. Um, I mentioned hearing or vision problems. If you're not really adapting for those or correcting for them, that could have a real impact on the score. Uh, and there are some hand writing things like that clock I mentioned. If you've got limited hand function, that would not be a good test either. As I keep saying, they're definitely not good as standalone measures. However, um, in a, a situation with um, collateral input with knowledge of health history and consideration of other risk factors, that sort of full context, they can be really useful. And then in that case, maybe sort of a final piece of making a diagnosis. Uh, we gave uh, Mo uh, Joseph the VOCA, in case you forgot about Joseph at this point, uh, and he got a 25. Um, so, oh, sorry, in terms of interpretation, that is 26 and above, according to the MOCA people, is kind of considered probably normal, typical thinking. Um, but under 26, I believe it's down to 21, of course, I can't remember at the moment, is kind of more the might be some mild cognitive impairments, um, but not necessarily. Um, and so he's kind of in our gray zone. What have we left out, though? All the pieces of the puzzle for a, a possible dementia diagnosis? Not at all. We have to think about um, independence and daily living. So looking over, this is the, called the functional activities questionnaire, and it's on that pocket card I mentioned, um, as is the mini cog that I talked about earlier, and the red flags. Um, this functional activities questionnaire has 10 questions, getting at some really important instrumental activities of daily living. It has scoring such that you can score if someone's dependent, maybe they need assistance, has difficulty but can still do by self, and normal. Also, you have to think about whether they have always been able to do the activity but can't now, or it's something that they never did and could they do it now. So that's a really nice piece of that one that I like. Um, in case, in the situation of Joseph, he actually got a score of three, and that is in still the independent range. So we know that no matter what, 
he does not have dementia at this point. Um, although if his score had been a lot lower, say in the mid-teens, we might find ourselves wondering, was he really putting in full effort on that test, right? Uh, we always have to keep in mind that dementia is a diagnosis of exclusion. If there's a piece that doesn't seem to fit, you kind of have to go after it and, and niggle at it until you can kind of figure out um, because we don't want to make a mistake. Uh, this is a cartoon where the provider is looking at that MRI that he got and he's suddenly realizing uh, or realizing that there may be an explanation for the sudden memory loss. Uh, also, thinking about additional factors that can impact thinking and daily function, uh, the pocket card has a few of the top hitters we see here um, and that the research has shown. Um, I like to think about these because you can do it for folks that already have cognitive impairment, healthy brain aging approaches, but also you can do it starting at any age um, and especially for those that are just more concerned about changes in thinking. Uh, paying attention to medical conditions that um, improvement and control can positively affect thinking, as well as um, I have these listed as behavioral factors, but thinking about what sort of nutrition, what intake someone has, uh, alcohol, tobacco use, um, and then things for improving exercise and activity, decreasing stress. And what's really come out, we were aware of it before the pandemic, but it's become quite evident since the pandemic is the importance of socialization. And I don't mean going to a cocktail party or having to be like a, an incredible extrovert, but merely having those human connections um, and being able to talk to people and have them talk to you um, is part of uh, kind of human nature and really important. Okay. So I have this little, you'll have this in your slides. It's sort of what I call the Mind 3D's action plan. Step one is always to rule things out, maybe using these frontline tools or other tools that you um, find more useful or that are approved for your setting. Uh, then monitoring potentially, if you're sort of able to go next there, you've kind of ruled out anything acute, medical going on, you're sort of monitoring people over time, continuing to use frontline tools to catch any new changes early on. Maybe there's a red flag there early on that might lead to a more in-depth evaluation. Those things could include brain scans, maybe additional labs, maybe seeing a specialist as well. Uh, and thinking back to Joseph, uh, we were able to rule out delirium. Depression was not only identified, but depression treatment was initiated. Uh, and from this frontline approach, we would probably still have to say that dementia is to be determined and following him and monitoring over him, uh, him over time will be critical. Okay, so here is, um, a cartoon with an aging Superman standing at what appears to be a very high windowsill. He's looking back at Lois saying, dang, where was I going? So ending with a bit of levity here, is this a sign of dementia? Is it a sign of delirium? Is it a sign of depression? Ah, unless we do more, we won't know the answer to it. But just knowing that these three could be a critical component of what's going on is very important. Okay, I got through that in a good, timely manner. Uh, so I am going to just talk, remind you here, we were talking about age-friendly healthcare, particularly talking about mentation, the three Bs. Uh, I'm going to stay on, of course, we hopefully have time for discussion and questions. I could talk about ad nauseum any of the things we've covered. Um, I also want to share um, the three Ds and delirium card contact information. If you did like those tools and you want to ask for some to be mailed to you, uh, this uh, excellent triage, edu uh, sorry, uh, rec education nurse that I work with, Julie, has a big old stash in her office, and you don't have to necessarily work for the VA. These are these are just free products. Anything I develop is 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 anyone else's working for the government, as I do. Okay. Amy and Peyton, how do you typically do this? Because I'm not sure how I can make it so that I can keep slides up and see yeah. people. You can keep slides up and I will go through questions. That was actually one of the first ones we were going to ask about is the 3Ds card information. So the guide. So thank you so much for putting that information up there. Uh, we put a link in the chat um, regarding something similar. But thank you so much for that contact. So everybody, please reach out. Um, we do have some questions, and if anybody has more questions, please feel free to put it in the Q&A. Um, our first question is, has there been 
Um, sorry, just a second. So um, is there any information that vascular dementia seems to be often associated with lifetime of smoking? Oh, this is a great question. So not only is smoking like incredibly related to development of uh, vascular dementia, it's actually also, and in some independent ways, uh, associated with all dementias and even Alzheimer's disease-based dementia. So it is, if there is, if you have a patient or anyone you know who is still smoking and you want like the biggest bang for your buck for improved health, like entirely, but especially for dementia prevention, smoking would be it. Um, and there's even a number of studies that show that unlike some other things where whatever you did in your 20s, you'll never be able to correct for, um, there are studies that show that when people quit smoking, even in their later life, after I can't remember if it's five years of not smoking, their risk has come back down to that closer to those who um, did not smoke. So, I mean, again, I, this is like, that's almost unfathomable, but that's what it's looking like in certain situations. Um, so there's a lot of, as I said, bang for buck if you can quit smoking. I do think you have to quit. Um, unlike alcohol use, where if you have um, a huge, pro you know, a much bigger problem and you can kind of do um, modifications to just be a light drinker, I unfortunately think that that doesn't show as much smoking similar, I'm sorry, that can show benefits, whereas with smoking, I think you have to completely quit. Uh, oh, wait, there she is. She disappeared. Hi, Amy. I'm so I sorry. I, I couldn't tell whose it was, and then I just got kicked out, so I'm back. <laughs> okay, so I think, um, I feel like I just missed, a question might have disappeared. Um, yeah, I'm slowly getting... Oh, there's a question about any data on spikes in alcohol. And questions food. back. I wonder so if you sorry. asked about that when I was mentioning the um, debit. Um, Alcohol-induced dementia is a tricky thing because there is, there are dementias, there are certain cognitive disorders that are very directly related to types of alcohol abuse. It's say when it's gone to the point where it's destroyed the mammillary bodies. So you think about like Wernicke's, um, Wernicke Korsakoff, but for the vast number of individuals who have an alcohol use disorder, they tend to develop a vascular dementia or be at higher risk for um, developing Alzheimer's disease. So I, and then I haven't done any deep dives into spikes of dementia due to the pandemic we're kind of a little too close to it to be to see those follow-up data yet in case that was the context okay now amy do you know where, where, where what's next in the question list since i just threw us all off oh what about vaping um we don't really know about vaping yet um there the effects in the brain from nicotine use, it's, it's, this is why I say there's, it's not just um, one single path by a cerebrovascular health that you would think maybe is more due to lung capacity and lung damage. Um, there's a lot of different paths and nicotine does have receptors in the brain. Uh, so I don't think we're gonna find that vaping is completely benign, um, uh, but the data really don't exist yet for that. Thank you. And I'm hopping on just because I think Amy might be having Wi-Fi issues. Yeah, thanks, baby. So, yeah, of course, I see that question about vaping. And then there's also um, another question saying, can dementia cause muscle loss? Ooh, uh, well, this is actually it's just maybe a more complicated question than you thought you were asking. Uh, the most prevalent causes of dementia and aging are not themselves directly associated with muscle loss, at least in the earlier stages of the disease with the pathologies in just general parts of the brain. Um, of course, in the latest stages when pathology might be in more um, primitive brain regions, like the controlled breathing and things like that, it could be. Uh, what typically in those dementias causes muscle loss is inactivity. Um, and you can imagine as cognition declines, it's hard, it's challenging to keep more active and to keep people more active. There are certain types of dementias though that actually affect motor neurons specifically. Uh, so um, folks are often familiar with ALS, 
that affects motor neurons, um, and there are many others. They don't tend to be the most common types of dementia, um, but yes, motor neuron disease can be a component of a number of different types of neurodegenerative diseases. Okay, hey, thank you. And then I have one more. Um, someone just commented, thank you so much, Re, the smoking issue. So not a question, but just wanted to shout that out. And then uh, another person asked, where would be a good place to start to diagnose a person with possible dementia in another state? Oh, they, I think the last part is just they're saying they're, they're in another state. I see. I see. You're not with them physically. Are people able to take themselves off mute for the webinar? Peyton, or is this, is that sort of one of the web, because I don't, I might need more information if you mean, is it like a loved one that you're trying to convince to like go in and get care? Or is it that you um, are doing like remote work, you're doing telehealth and they are in a different state and you're working with them via virtual care? Because I would sort of approach it differently if it's more about like family, friends, uh, kind of loved ones, or is it more of like from the healthcare provider perspective? Yeah, I see the person in the chat said, yes, family member, I'm in Illinois, and they're in Georgia. Well, that's, I hear that, I definitely, um, I hear that one often um, from my own family and friends, right, uh, asking me what I would recommend. Uh, I think it's about finding the angle, uh, and that means uh, what matters to them. And I hate to put it like as a, like a manipulative thing, what matters, but if you can um, help them identify or and you identify what's really important to them and kind of suggest how then going in for a workup, probably starting with primary care, um, but they have to go into their primary care for a specific appointment because they're concerned about thinking or get the loved one that's there with them in that state to go into the appointment with them. You can't call in and make the appointment for your your spouse say before a memory problem and then send them in alone and think that it's actually gonna go how you want it to go. Um, and that's tricky, right? Because we're adults and we should be able to do things independently and alone. And so navigating kind of those relationships and feelings can be challenging. Um, I'm trying to think what are some of the like sort of, you know, the, the what matters piece, like, well, you really like to go camping alone and I want you to be able to continue to do that, but you've been in a couple car accidents and it'd be important to rule out that there's not something going on that needs treatment so that you won't have more car accidents. I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of just spouting off now, but it, it is sort of that goal. Yeah, it sounds really complicated. Now it's like I'm seeing if, just a reminder in the chat, uh, we do have a bit of time left. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q and A. Oh yeah, yeah. The person who asked that question said he has been he has left his home wandering the street, found by the police having hallucinations. Um, I said to get a mental health evaluation at ER and start there. Right, and if it's an older loved one, um, the ER is the place to start. It's not where you want the, to start, right? Ideally, this would have gotten something would have been picked up on maybe that was developing through less acute healthcare, um, urgent care situations. But if that's what's happening, then yes, the ER, um, both mental health and all aspects of health um, should be checked out. In an older adult, if that came on acutely, it could be a sign of delirium. Um, it also, if it didn't come on quite so acutely, it could be a sign of other, one of the other Ds or other things as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely an acute situation. And maybe if it didn't happen, they didn't get taken in and seen by medical providers trying to, even if things have calmed down, saying, hey, you know, that really kind of scary situation happened and it doesn't seem like a full workup's been done. Let's get in and just make sure there's nothing that's going to happen again. Yeah, they said, thank you. I appreciate it. So. With that, I'm going to move on to the other Q&A questions I see. All right, so I have another person asking, is it better to see a gerontologist, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, if you can find one for older patients instead of seeing a family practice provider? Oh, um, you know, uh, that's, a, that's such a tricky one because 
I think it all depends on the provider. Uh, I think that there are so many internists, family practice providers, you know, sort of general primary care providers that are fantastic um, that you don't necessarily need to see a gerontologist. It's hard. It's really hard to find a gerontologist. Um, I have family in a decent sized city in the Midwest that I would like to switch from a primary care provider that I see not ordering the right labs and, and prescribing things that are on the beers list to older relatives. And unfortunately, I started looking and I couldn't find a geriatric specialist that was taking patients in their area. So I, I think it's more um, trying to ask the right questions of a potential new provider if you're not looking at a gerontologist to um, just see are they savvy? Are they really kind of um, in tuned with the age span or are they really just focused on, you know, colds and cuts and things that are less, you know, yeah. So that's, a, that, that's tricky only in that um, it's about a match, right? I'm sure we've all gone to a, a, a healthcare provider of some kind and been like, okay, I don't think we're a really good fit, whether it's mental health or sort of what you think of as your general medical health. If you don't have a good fit, it's just not a good fit. Yeah, thank you. I see also people in the chat are kind of jumping off early, but some people were saying oh, that they really valued this training. So it's always nice to hear that. And we do have a few uh, really good questions that are popping in right here. So I see one person asking, you didn't really touch on psychosis and overlap with dementia symptoms. Can you talk briefly about this? I don't really focus. Um, sorry, I didn't. You did miss it. You're correct. Um, I don't because it's not as much my area of expertise. And also those three um, top dementia uh, causes, Alzheimer's, disease as an underlying pathology in when we get to like autopsy and we can look at the brain pathology it's about 75 percent of incident cases in older adult have alzheimer's disease going on a big chunk of that and then the next big chunk is vascular changes and lewy body disease which can have some more psychiatric symptoms associated with it earlier on is actually a pretty small percentage so in the earliest stages of most cases of dementia, psychosis is not typically a feature. That's something that might come along more in the moderate to severe stages. And my talk really was kind of aimed more at early identification and workup. So if there is psychosis early on, which obviously psychosis is a big term, right? It, it covers a lot of different symptoms. Um, you might wanna take a slightly different tack. Um, you, I would argue that mental health, those sort of more traditional mental health diagnoses might be higher on the list. Um, now, psychosis also, though, could be a marker of substance use disorder. It could be a marker of uh, I mean, brain pathology other than neurodegenerative disease. If it's coming on more acutely, you'd want a brain scan to rule out um, you know, tumors, uh, things like that. It, so I'm sorry, it's, it's kind of it's a, it's a big area, um, and it's not one of the most typical symptoms you would see in the earliest stages. And then I see another person asking, um, they're not sure if, it, if they missed this, um, suggestions on what to do with the mini cog and or mocha if the client has significant hand tremors and cannot write, as if they can't do the clock. Yeah, so I do think that's a thing. Um, the sometimes so people depending on what the cause of their hand tremors is whether it's parkinson's disease or is it essential tremor um depending on the size of the format you work with with them you, you might be able to do it say in a, an essential tremor it's whether it gets worse in a larger format or smaller i personally don't judge the line length so strictly if someone has a tremor um uh on the other hand, something like that little trails thing on the actual mocha form is tiny. There is a, a version you can print up if you go on their website that's larger. That might be easier for some people. Um, at the very end of the day, you can also try to prorate the measures. I'm trying to think. I feel like the, um, the slums actually has far less motor components. That could be a better option as long as it's not missing the mark horribly in some other way. 
Thank you. And then I have another question. These are just rolling in now that we're actually getting closer to time. But <laughs> I see someone said um, or asked, as our society, uh, a, as our society's age grows with the boomers, are health professionals being encouraged to well check their parent their patients' emergency contacts over 65 every other year? Or do these 3D screenings um, happen every other year with collateral calls? I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I I'm getting that completely. Can you see that question? I may not be quite understanding. I, I think um, I'm almost hearing two things. I'm hearing that people have these like emergency contacts and collateral sometimes in their like clinical charts. And as you age, you probably ought to update those or make sure that they're current regularly. Um, I don't there's, if you think about HIPAA rules, though, there, if it's actually a question of do you just call people to ask about their loved ones, I mean, that would be a, a huge violation, uh, of course. I don't think this is what you were asking, but that would be a HIPAA violation. Uh, what we are always trying to do is encouraging people to bring their friend, their neighbor, their spouse, their adult child in with them. Um, now, I can mail questionnaires to someone ahead of our visit and have one of them be, find a close loved one who's known you for at least 10 years and ask them to fill this out. They can either come in with you or they can just send it in. But if the patient brings it in, if they're the one that's gotten the information, then that isn't violating um, their privacy, right? They're, they're bringing it in um, or they themselves have handed it to the person to bring in or send it. Um, I do find collateral information to be incredibly helpful. Now you have to think about the reliability of it. Uh, I, the, the reason for Joseph's case that I brought up, the, the, his ex-wife, they were married less than five years um, and they had had kind of an acrimonious breakup. I, I, I put that in there specifically because I remember that type of collateral is probably not a good one, right? He might say, oh yeah, you can call my ex-wife, but if she like really didn't like him and treated him badly, she might say things that don't really aren't particularly valid. So I think that's the challenge. And then like in Joseph's case, his daughter has known him for a really long time, but hasn't lived near him for very long. So there are other pieces where the daughter doesn't have as much perspective. So sometimes you're putting um, multiple pieces together to get a full context. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you for pressing that question. I'm not very familiar with all that, so appreciate that. And then um, this other person had a question, um, kind of a story. So I'm gonna kind of parse uh, some well, key bits out. I think I can yeah. see it caught up. Is it what if a person has random issues? Yes, and then there's the comment a bit. Yeah, um, so there's a comment down at the bottom too. Part, it takes them an hour to find their car. Then a few months later, they go to the same store, start to panic that they can't find their car keys to go into the store, only to realize 15 minutes later that they're in the ignition since they just drove there. Well, this is pretty specific. Um, this is not, I don't, I can't say that this wouldn't be a red flag. Um, that, but it could happen for many things other than say a dementia. Um, it doesn't sound like a delirium because you're talking about something that doesn't seem to be getting dramatically worse over a few months, right? Delirium comes on more acutely and it will get bad. It will keep getting worse. Um, so, you know, could it be a mood thing or, or are they stressed? Um, you know, it could be a lot of different things, um, but maybe trying to track how often that's happening, get them in for a workup, probably pretty important. I don't know that it's as random as it sounds at first, unless it's the only two things that have ever happened and everything else is organized, right? Uh, sometimes if that's someone you, you go, you get a glimpse inside their house and then you realize, oh no, you know, the, the wheels are coming off the cart. Um, it's not just an, a, a, a particular notable incident. The same person uh, asked a question a bit further down that says, um, so it's basically that it's this person is having, having these random issues with memory, but it's happening years later. Or once they remember, no other issues happen for months or years after that. That is, I mean, again, I, I want to be careful. I don't know the actual, all the situation or anything. That is not a typical profile for what would be a brain-based medial temporal lobe type memory change. Um, I'm not saying it's psychogenic or you know not doesn't have a biological basis, 
but that is not a typical change one would see with something like Alzheimer's or vascular dementia. With that sort of islands of memory loss, you know, a lot of times people then end up in situations where they are getting evaluated by neurology for whether they might have a seizure disorder. Um, there can be a lot of other things like that. Yeah, thank you for that. Come and go. Um, and then the next one we have is, can Parkinson's-related dementia lead to delirium in a person diagnosed before the age of 40? Parkinson's-related dementia leads to delirium. Well, so any, anyone with a dementia diagnosis is, by nature of having a dementia diagnosis, it, it's been associated with increased risk for developing delirium. So I, and the, on the face of it, it doesn't necessarily matter how old someone is if they have that diagnosis. Um, and before the age of 40, obviously, is highly unusual, both for having Parkinson's disease, but especially for having um, been diagnosed with Parkinson-related dementia. So um, that person's pretty unique uh, already, or not unique, sorry, they're, they're in a smaller, um, uh, there's just fewer people in that situation. So I would argue, of course it could. Yeah, um, that would be really tough. Yeah, a lot of maybes and a lot of go see a doctor. Very hard. <laughs> yeah, if they've already been diagnosed with Parkinson's related dementia, I hope that means that they are well connected in healthcare, yeah. And yeah. to probably lean on some of those resources. Um, yeah, for sure. Sorry, last question we have um, as we get closer to time is what is the connection with hearing loss and the three Ds slash Alzheimer's? Ooh, what is the connection with hearing loss and these three Ds and Alzheimer's? So that's an interesting question. It makes me wonder if you've read some of like, there's a Lancet commission um, that's talked at different spans of life, what are risk factors for dementia and hearing loss just can, kind of keeps coming out in different associative studies as being related to risk of dementia. Um, so I got to tell you, I don't feel like I fully, or anybody, sorry, it's not just me. I would say this, the scientific community does not feel like it fully understands that relationship. Um, it can be that hearing loss somehow has a direct mechanistic effect, or it's that people who have hearing loss tend to be less socially engaged and maybe not as cognitively active because they're, they're sort of separated in certain ways. Um, and that is a risk factor. It could be that just less good information is coming into the brain to keep it stimulated. And thus there's a kind of a valerian, like kind of a negative effect backward in that way. Um, there's some research that suggests the people that are wearing hearing aids will do better. Um, and so does that, does that help us understand it? Um, so you ask a very good question. I do not have the answer to that, nor to, I think there's a lot of hypotheses in that area. It is definitely appreciated that if you can try to treat hearing loss, um, that there are, are definite benefits. Um, but hearing aids are not always easy to deal with. Um, I, of course, advocate for their use as much as possible. Um, you, know, you can't get good information in. There's no chance for your brain to do a good job with it or to even work with it at all. Right. Well, thank you. I think that's the last question we had, and we are almost out of time. That was amazing, Emily. Thank you. I know I learned a lot, um, very useful information. And just for everyone in the um, chat and anyone in the room who might still be here, the QR code on the screen will lead to our survey link. So just take a look at that or click the link in the chat that I put in there. And um, again, Zoom will send you the link to where the recording will be put. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you next time. And thank you, you're a wonderful audience. Thank you.